you, Barney. Fairest Lord Jesus, one of the conversations I had this morning was about the incredible variety and beauty of all of creation. And that's what we're here to celebrate uh, this morning, the, the wonder and the glory of our Lord. Let's begin um, by singing number 472. And if you are able, please rise as we sing number 472. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we have come into this place to be amazed, stunned, and shocked by your glory. And so help us this morning to set aside all of the fears and the shame and the hurt that we bring here this morning, to be with you, to look fully into your loving face, and to know that we are your children. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The call to worship this morning is not from a psalm. You may have noticed that already. It's from 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And then the sermon this morning will be coming from Mark 10, verses 1 through 16. Right. Hannah prayed and said, my heart exalts in the Lord. My strength is exalted in my God. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in my victory. There is no holy one like the Lord. No one beside you is your rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge. And by him, all actions are weighed. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread. But those who are hungry are fat with spoil. The barren has borne seven. But she who has many children is forlorn. Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low. He also exalts. He will guide the feet of his faithful ones. But the wicked shall be cut off in darkness, for not by might does one prevail. The Lord the Lord Amen. Now if you take your hymn books again. And turn to number 362, number 362.
you. You may be seated. The sermon this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 10, verses 1 through 16. Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verses 1 through 16. 
Jesus left that place and went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan. And crowds again gathered around him, and as was his custom, he again taught them. Some Pharisees came to test him. They asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Then in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. He said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. Let's pray. Lord, help us this morning to slow down, to hear your word, to inwardly digest it. Help us to hear you. And we ask all this in your name. Amen. <clears throat> this is a passage that has been used to beat up on an awful lot of people. It has been used often with a big stick to bludgeon and wound the already wounded and broken. It has been used to create great shame and guilt and rejection among God's people. Among some followers of Jesus and in some of their congregations, it is divorce that is the unforgivable sin. Sometimes divorced people are prohibited from teaching Sunday school, leading Bible studies, or even from holding a church office, whatever it might be. And often the justification comes from a very literal interpretations of the words that we read here in Mark's Gospel. And they are very difficult words, to say the least. They seem to be very direct, pointed, clear, and indisputable. And they come from the very lips of Jesus himself. If you have made a point to, discuss, to, to study uh, the biblical passages on divorce, you already know that the other Gospels provide a bit of an out in the parallel passages to this one. That's somewhat refreshing, uh, but it really doesn't help us very much with what we read here. And so when we are faced with a passage like this, we need to remind ourselves of the character of Jesus himself. On the one hand, Jesus demanded extraordinarily high standards of those 
who would be his followers. Phrases like, let the dead bury the dead, or go and sell all that you have and give to the poor. Those should come to mind when we think of the high standards that Jesus has for those who would be his followers. Certainly, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you fits into that category and continues to set an extraordinarily high standard. And yet, on the other hand, Jesus was never much for legalism or legalistic interpretations of the law. Once, when he was criticized for not demanding that his disciples wash their hands before they ate, Jesus replied by going straight to the scriptures, and he said, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites. As it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. That's some pretty harsh criticism about hand washing. Don't you think? Although, on the other hand, let's hope that Jesus would be in favor of hand sanitizer. And Jesus was frequently accused of breaking the laws of the Sabbath because he had this pesky habit of choosing the Sabbath as the day on which to make other people well. Jesus seemed to believe that people were more important than rules and regulations. And so we've got this sort of paradoxical balance with Jesus. First of all, very high standards for his followers. But secondly, but closely coupled with those high standards, Jesus has a deep and loving regard for people who must struggle with the imposed demands of legalism. And while it is absolutely true that Jesus is setting a very high standard for marriage in this passage, it is also very true that Jesus deeply and completely empathizes with our human condition. That was last Sunday. It is, after all, the human condition of sin and failure that Jesus came to this earth to save us from. There is no question that marriage is and can be a wonderful thing. Marriage was instituted by God at the very beginning of creation. It is an opportunity for two persons to enter into a relationship that models the intimacy of the divine trinity in every aspect of our human existence. This is why marriage is sacred and holy. It is why it is sometimes called a sacrament. And it is called a sacrament because it fosters intimacy at every level of our lives that we can only rightly experience with one other person. Marriage is sacred, but it is also very limiting. And so we have sexual intimacy. Let's get that right out front. And then there is also emotional intimacy, financial intimacy, and spiritual intimacy. All of these are critical to the development of a good marriage. All of this intimacy takes a lifetime to mature and to grow into. And so that is why marriage is considered to be a lifetime commitment. And when it works, marriage is good. And couples look forward to growing old together. I am sure that... (laughs) 
It's Pat and Dawn's wedding anniversary today, too, by the way. Um, I am sure that Jesus intended for us to choose our marriage partners very carefully and that he intended for us to spend a lifetime learning to love each other. That is the ideal. That is the high standard that Jesus sets. And yet, as wonderful as the ideal is, Jesus knows, as well as we know, that we are imperfect creatures, and that we are sometimes incapable of living up to the high standards that he sets for us. And this is true not only in our marriage relationships, but also in every other relationship that God is pleased to give us. We have the potential to mess up all of our relationships. And we do this because we are sinners. We tend to focus on ourselves and on our own needs before we even begin to tend to the needs of others. Very few of us are very good at loving one another. And we all have trails of broken relationships that follow us wherever we go. None of us is a perfect spouse. None of us is a perfect parent. None of us excels in our relationships with our sisters and brothers in Christ. And perhaps most important of all, none of us perfectly loves our Lord. And yet the good news is that our Lord perfectly loves us. When the Pharisees came to Jesus with their question about divorce, they knew perfectly well what the correct answer was. They knew that Moses permitted a man to divorce his wife. They knew that the divorce rate in Palestine was very high. I suppose that shouldn't be too terribly surprising to any of us, given our own high divorce rate today. It is simply a reminder to us that we humans have always been human, no matter what century in which we may have lived. And so when they come to Jesus, they expect Jesus to quote from the law. Being smart people, though, and not a little bit sneaky, my suspicion is that once Jesus quoted the law on divorce, that the Pharisees would challenge Jesus with the ideal that is set forth in the book of Genesis. And they might even try to force Jesus to decide which is more important, the law or the created ideal. But Jesus is also pretty smart, and he comes down squarely on the ideal set forth in Genesis. The ideal, then, is what we should always aim for. And I am sure that all of us do. In all my years of helping couples to strive for the ideal in marriage, I have never had a couple sit on my couch and say, well, we're going to try this marriage thing for a while, uh, but if it doesn't work out, we'll just get divorced. Uh, now, while it is true that no couple has ever been that honest with me, many of the knots that I have been instrumental in tying have become unraveled, and sometimes in a very short time. In order for marriage to work, and to work well, all three parties, all three parties engaged have to cooperate with one another. God, of course, is always cooperative. But what about the other two? Not so much. Sexual histories, drugs, 
alcohol, children, financial struggles, peer pressure. All manner of uninvited guests come stomping into that relationship, demanding attention, and it begins to suffer. More than half the time, it suffers to the point of death. And couples who were once so right for each other and who believed that with all of their hearts now have so much wrong with each other that divorce happens. And when divorce happens, it is always sad, always difficult, and always painfully gut-wrenching. Admitting failure is incredibly difficult under any circumstances. But divorce is also a very public failure. And that makes it doubly difficult. When divorce happens, the church needs to respond with love and compassion. Too often, it responds with the opposite. It responds with rejection. When someone in our midst is at their worst, feeling more miserable than they have ever felt, absolutely convinced that they are a complete failure, embarrassed by their situation, and ashamed and self-condemning, that's when we need to reach out in love and with acceptance. That's when, when Jesus reaches out in love. But sadly, and ironically too often, that's not when the church, or that is when the church, is most powerfully adamant in the rejection of one of her own. We often divorce the divorced among us. And it would do us re well to remember that the first female evangelist that Jesus ever commissioned was a woman. How many times divorced? Five. Five times divorced. And that woman holds an honored and significant place right here in this house of worship. And that's where the second half of this passage enters the picture. Last May, as you all recall, I preached from this passage, and I began the sermon <clears throat> with the bit about the children, rather than ending it with the children, like I am this morning. At first, the blessing of the children doesn't seem to be connected to the teaching on divorce at all. Mark, on the other hand, seems to believe quite otherwise. Some people have brought children to Jesus hoping that he would touch them. Jesus' disciples, however, make it clear that there is no time available to be wasting on children. And becoming very indignant at his disciples' ignorance, Jesus says, Let the little children come to me, and do not stop them. For it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Jesus makes it very clear here that he rejects no one. Not children. Not you or me, not divorced people, not sinners, no one. Jesus receives and welcomes all. And that becomes a powerful lesson for all who would be the followers of Jesus. Jesus rejects no one. That is yet another high standard that Jesus sets. And it is one that we would do well to follow at all times. And then Jesus goes on to say, 
Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. That verse shouts loudly at me. But it also fills me with deep hope. Jesus welcomes us not as perfected saints, not as folks who've got all their stuff together, not as folks who know their theology and their laws, but rather as little children. When we come as little children, we must leave behind all of our wonderfulness, our imagined perfection, our self-righteousness, our disdain for others, and our out-and-out -out rejection of those who do not meet our standards. But we must bring along all of our own brokenness, our hurt, our fears, and our failures, because all of us have these things too. And we bring our brokenness, our hurt, our fears, and our failures to leave them at Jesus' feet. We do not carry them with us. We do not lug them around as a lifelong burden. We give them to Jesus. We let go of them. We receive forgiveness and healing. That is what the gospel is all about. Jesus died to erase the, the effects of our failures. He lives so that we can live with hope, not despair. And that is the wonderful thing about becoming a child when we come to Jesus. We get to start over. The messes that we have made of our lives are no longer the slightest bit relevant. They are no longer our burden. We come as clean slates or deleted histories, whichever makes more sense to you. We lay hold securely to the forgiveness, the restoration, the redemption, and the healing that Jesus offers. Jesus gives us a brand new life. I love it that Jesus takes the little children into his arms. I love it that he embraces them and that he enfolds them lovingly and tenderly. And I love it because all of us so desperately need to be lovingly embraced. We desperately need to be covered by the loving and comforting grace of God. This is our Lord's high standard of grace. Let us always exercise this high standard of grace with one another. Let's pray. Lord, may we be like you when dealing with all of those whom we believe are lesser than ourselves. Amen. Our hymn of response today is number 629. And if you're able, please rise as we sing.
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Long before Jesus walked on this planet, the psalmist knew what it meant for the Lord to make him whole. The psalmist knew what it meant for him to have his sins forgiven, his life restored. The word restore means to rebuild, to refurbish, to make like new. That's what Jesus was talking about this morning when he brought up the little children. Go forth this week to make someone's life new again. Go forth this week to help and to aid in the restoration of someone's broken soul. That's your benediction, even though we're going to sing, and then we'll leave. Number 719. 